In the early hours of August 27, 1985, the voice of Major General Joshua Dungoyaru of the Nigerian Army, heralded by martial music, informed the Nigerian nation that power had been seized in the power school from General Muhammad Buhari and Major General Tunei Diagbon. The military coup d'etat brought in Major General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida, who declared himself military president, becoming the first military president in Africa and possibly the entire world. Babangida wears a smile that was in stark contrast with his unsmiling predecessor, General Muhammad Buhari, whom he has just overthrown. But was this sociable and smiling general any better than his stern and unsmiling predecessor? In this edition on Hispul Media, we revisit the untold story of Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida and his emergence as the first and only military president of Nigeria, as well as his administration's high-handedness and abuses. Please come with me. If you enjoy our stories, consider subscribing to the channel for more African history stories. Thank you. Following the military coup d'etat on August 27, 1985, a variety of reasons were put forth to justify the coup. These range from widespread corruption to severe economic hardship due to the austerity measures implemented in the country as a result of the International Monetary Fund IMF deadlock created by the Shehu Shagari administration. In addition, allegations of brutality by Ibuari Idiagbon, which culminated in the enactment of state security detention of Persons Decree No. 2 of 1984, were advanced. This decree empowered Major General Tunde Idiagbon's chief of staff to detain anyone perceived as a security threat for up to six months without trial. The new sheriff also criticized Decree No. 4 of 1984, under which the Buhari regime imprisoned two Guardian journalists, Tunde Thompson and Nduka Irabo. It is clear that the decree was issued to restrict the media from reporting news that may embarrass government officials. Among other things, these decrees were seen to have practically transformed the country into a virtual military garrison. Apart from this local crisis, the mishandling of certain foreign affairs such as a deco crate affair, which resulted in a diplomatic standoff between Nigeria and Britain, xenophobia, which resulted in the expulsion of West African aliens during the Shagari era, and the IMF stalemate were a huge embarrassment for a country that regards itself as a regional leader. And according to Babangida, these crises have harmed the country's international reputation and made Nigeria an international laughingstock. Further to this, the new administration condemned Buari Diagmon's foreign policy, saying, quote, Nigeria's foreign policy was characterized by inconsistency and incoherence. It lacked the clarity to make us know where we stood in matters of international concern to enable other countries to relate to us with seriousness. Our external relations have been conducted by policy of retaliatory reactions. But before we get into the Babangida administration's brutality and abuses, let us look at more reasons why his emergence was made easier. Apart from the discontent of senior military officers like Babangida, more mundane reasons were given over the years to justify the August coup d'etat. The reasons were many and varied. For instance, an unpublished thesis written in 1989 by Major Habibu Idrus Shaibu claimed that General Babangida's coup d'etat was motivated by his refusal to offer positions to junior officers. Another unsubstantiated source reports that the postponement of the promotion of Colonel Joshua Dongoyaro to Brigadier may have enraged him and those around him. Obviously, these were the perspective whether true or not of some of the junior and middle-ranking officers that were used to execute the coup. However, this does not explain the coup at the level of the initiators. Another interesting twist was the alleged involvement of civilians in the military coup d'etat. Unconfirmed reports speculate profound displeasure on the part of Chief MKO Abiola, a business mogul who was alleged to have helped in financing the coup in 1983. It is claimed that Abiola was upset not only with the decision of the Buhari regime to seize and auction a large consignment of his newsprint mint for Concord newspaper, which had allegedly been smuggled into the country, but also with an inquiry into the possible role of his relative in drug trade. 
The story alleged that these actions of the regime motivated Abiola to financially assist the removal of the general, Muhammad Buhari, from office. But Abiola was not the only disgruntled figure in the private sector, as unconfirmed report identified other individuals with business interests like Dan Tata to have a personal grudge against the Buhari government. All sort of unfortunate events kept occurring at the time. One such happening was the arrest of one Ikumola for trying to smuggle a large consignment of cocaine out of the country. Following the investigation, a son of one of the Dantatars was indicted and they were both tried and sentenced to death. The Dantata family mounted pressure on the Supreme Military Council to commit the sentence to life, but to no avail. This development was believed to have created division among members of the Supreme Military Council, with a high-ranking military benefactor siding with the Dantata family. But this was not the only issue. The arrest of one Gloria Okon in 1985 at the Aminu Kanu International Airport for drug-related offenses created serious friction in the hierarchy of the Nigerian military at the time. It appears that intellectuals also played a role in Babangida's military coup d'etat. Professor Omo Omori, who served as the Director General of the Center for Democratic Studies during the Babangida regime and was known as a confidant and advisor to the former military general, claimed to be privy and party to Babangida's personal decision to overthrow the government of Major General Muhammad Buhari. Major General M.C. Ali, who served as Deputy Director Joint Services at Supreme Headquarters, had this to say, quote, Tensions between the army, specifically Babangida and Abacha, and the Buhari regime, specifically Buhari and Idiagbo, came to a head when Ministry of Defense contracts and accounts were placed under scrutiny. Well, the question you may want to ask yourself now is, was Babangida able to do better in addressing the ills of the previous regime as identified above? Well, from the beginning of his regime and in order to consolidate power, the Babangida administration vowed among other things to protect the fundamental human rights and civil liberty of Nigerians. In a show of good faith, the Babangida regime abrogated the Draconia Decree No. 4, Public Officers' Protection Against False Publication, freed political prisoners and reorganized the intelligence services when he signed into law the National Security NSA Decree No. 19 of 5th June 1986. Arguably, throughout President Babangida's regime, the government ignored the rule of law. Government agencies like the police, the state security services and directorate of military intelligence perpetrated human rights abuses and operated with absolute impunity. Aside from creating horrifying detention conditions, torture centers were operated primarily to silence critics. Unfortunately though, the optimism that heralded Babangida's coup was short-lived. Shortly after taking over, the administration had a series of brushes with organized bodies like the Academic Staff Union of Universities ASU, the National Association of Nigerian Students NANS, and the Nigerian Labor Congress NLC. A major reoccurring theme in the ASU Babangida regime's confrontation was the poor state of university education in the country. Unfortunately, that is still a problem to this day. ASU argued that this was due to the combination of three factors, including inadequate funding, lack of internal autonomy, and poor remuneration of Nigerian university workers. The first major crisis that prompted government's proscription of the union in July 1988 was ASU's rejection of an apparent government decision to de-emphasize university education. This was a position of the IMF as canvassed at the meeting of vice-chancellors of African universities in Harare in 1986. But the union would be recognized again in August 1990 and proscribed again in August 1992. Just like ASU, the National Association of Nigerian Students NANS, was proscribed several times. But at every instance, the association defied the regime and continued to meet in the burden. The policy trust of the regime was also a subject of discontent among the Nigerian people. The regime's adoption of the Structural Adjustment Program SAB, though accepted by most elites at the time, is still being criticized 
to this day. In fact, we hope to make a dedicated video about the structural adjustment program of the Babangidas regime in due course. Please let us know in the comment section if you would like to see such a video. However, Ali Shiroma, former president of the NLC, described the structural adjustment program as the mother of all evils that the Babangida junta imposed on Nigeria. Shiroma believes the evil intent of the regime reached its climax after the annulment of June 12, 1993 presidential election, where pro democracy groups, including labor unions, were victims of the burning repression unleashed on the Nigerian people. The corruption he promised to fight became a common and unstoppable occurrence throughout his inglorious days. Indeed, Babangida's regime, like many other military regimes, became synonymous with corruption, which is why, as stated earlier, they staged a coup d'etat in the first place. In fact, during the dictatorial regime of Babangida, for example, corruption was elevated to the level of state policy, and allegations of corrupt activities were treated with levity. This was a serious setback and would destroy the gains of the previous administration in its effort to limit corruption in the country. In all of its underhand dealings, the Babangida regime was even more hostile to the press. The relationship between the government and the media became badly damaged as the regime intimidated and harassed media houses and journalists. Unfortunately, the attack on journalists reached an all-new height in 1986 when Delegiwa, the then editor-in-chief of Newswatch, was murdered by a letter bomb allegedly planted by members of the state security apparatus. For more on the assassination of Delegiwa with a letter bomb in 1986, please watch this video here. And for more on his administration's manipulation of the June 12 presidential election in Nigeria, please click this video here. But don't forget to like this video and subscribe to his pool media for more interesting African history stories. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.